the little houses having their own windmills. Um, I'm going to have my first poem here. It's a short one. It's called Ultima Fool. Um, which is what the Romans used to call what may have been Orkney. It kind of means the Isle to the North, the unknown Isle to the North. There's all, whatever culture you're in, um, possibly apart from the Antarctic and the Arctic, uh, there's always an Isle to the North. And for those of you who are of a certain age, this has a reference to an orange juice song in it. <laughs> the sea is very humdrum as it stretches my favourite sky far away and trails amplitudes of cloud and sun over these northern Aegean atolls marked by wind towers with which they hoist up the big idea that someday every isle will be under sail with a turbine whose blades usher in another Triketra era. I'm not sure of the pronunciation of Triketra, but it's the Celtic knot form, which is a three. I think it's interesting that in Scotland there's such an emphasis now on wind energy, which has a, a, a threeness with the blades, that classic threeness. And um, if you look back at the Celtic knot system, it's also a threeness. Um, and this is another example of, as it were, reading the past into the future. My friend Laura Watson and I, she's a cultural, geog cultural geographer in Copenhagen, like to play with these forms as being uh, Norse windmills. This is from, oh, correct me, is it Mays Howe? I think it's Mays Howe, the one by the Ring of Brodgar, where a bunch of Norse pirates got stuck in a blizzard for three days and began to carve on runes, um, mainly joking about who'd fucked who, actually. Um, so we have this old technology which I retranslated into windmill, and Laura had already retranslated into hill and moon. Now, when you're in Orkney, as anyone who's been there knows, the verticals are pretty crucial. There aren't many trees. And so whenever there has been a vertical, it really imprints itself into the culture. The ring of Brodgar standing stones would be an obvious case. The radar masts that were very important from the Second World War, and now the windmills. When you have a landscape like that, any vertical, um, asserts itself and becomes a way of aligning and understanding the landscape. And then I wanted to show you some sketches which um, explore this idea I was talking about of how can we bridge between technology and nature? Is there a bridge there already? You could read this um, these are the sketches I made in my studio during the project to try and understand my own thinking and, and the way we all sketch. You could read this drawing in either direction and it would have the same logic of an evolution. And there's a few other pieces. Can you, can you read that alright? Petals or blades? It's a particular site on Rousey that, that really imprinted itself on my mind as being like a wind garden, which is a place called Erverdale, which is a test station, twin to a windmill manufacturer in, um, I think, near Birmingham. And the guy really does test out lots of different devices. I can't remember, sorry if I told this story before, but he had these wonderful um, solar panels, just about three of them. And he made a kind of structure to hold them, which had a device using old van axle, old van hubs and motorcycle chains so that he could turn it to follow the sun. And he said that he got the energy produced by his solar panels up by 27%, effectively by converting them into sunflowers. 
which is, you know, that's what a sunflower does. So he was working with nature and working, he was testing what would it mean if you have a solar panel installed so that it can actually follow the sun. So we know to play within culture between old ideas and new ideas. Enjoying some puns and bringing the technology back into things that, that we know about. Drawing forms, cultural forms, language. And as we see that kind of commonality of natural and made forms, I think what we're really doing is promoting, discovering, sharing that gentling of the technology. Any new, most, I would say any new technology has a shocking effect when it first comes in. You know, we all know about the tradition of the sublime and so on, and windmills are no different. And one of the things that happens in any culture is that the windmill goes from being a, a symbol of the demonic in Dante to being a symbol of the pastoral in Constable. In just the same way, um, wind towers, for some of us, have already shifted into the pastoral. For others, are still shocking, are still intrusive. But that process of, if you could call it, acclimatization, it doesn't happen by understanding the engine. It doesn't happen by being able to make one. It happens by our having a feeling for the form. And so the instrument must regain its tenderness to and for us. Now that might have an ethical aspect. For some of us it might be that it's an antidote to global warming. But I think it can also in almost always does have a fondness. Have a, it's exactly what Latham did with Nidri women. He did take something ugly and through an idea give it a beauty. And art, as we know, has always done that. I wanted to then um, jump to an example of the technology just to see if we could go a bit further into that. Actually, I'm going to stop. Did anyone have a question? Or a disagreement or an agreement? I shouldn't just whitter away. The hum, the hum of the whatever it is, hum. Technology. Anyone want to check anything out? Wrapped audience. I was just in yeah. Hackney last week, and one of the interesting aspects of it was that people who had houses who wanted a windmill, and certainly on one occasion I know, the farmer allowed them to put a windmill in his field yeah. it's interesting. to feed their yeah. resource. And I thought that was yeah. fantastic. Or in the sense of ownership. Yeah. No, very much. No, you can't have that. No, that's my land. If you want to, you've got to pay for it. I think one of the most striking things about Orkney is that relationship between technology and agriculture. Right. They're, they're almost never separate. Yeah. And also the, 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 you know, the Nissan huts you see everywhere. Mm. There was a hell of a lot of wartime technology there which was absorbed. But I think mm. that they seem to see land there as not having edges but overlapping. So he would see that it was his field to grow the crop in but also their field to grow energy. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's the, that there is a communitarian sense there. And I think it's from a memory of when energy was very scarce. Mm -hmm. You know, that for a long time, they were not going to be in the national grid. And, and I, I don't think it's just a kind of romantic altruism. I think it's probably a hangover from being surrounded by a lot of, of, of technology, radar, battleships but actually having an incredible scarcity of something like electricity. And they would have seen the hydro schemes growing and, and, not, and then they weren't any really part of that. 
Um, so I think that they're, they're very keen. The other, the, I don't know if you noticed this, but one of the other interesting things is they have a lot of different devices of Little Windmill. Yes. Much more than you see down here. Um, there's a French company that imported some bi blades, two blades. And that's interesting too, that you, you, you're just seeing a, a, a richness. And you do sense that they're growing their own flowers. And they chat away about, mine does this, it doesn't do that. Yeah. I'm jealous that you were there. <laughs> so this is the seminal moment in wind energy in Britain. It's the most important site and device. It's the first ever large-scale windmill turbine erected and it was put up on Costa Head on Orney. And you can find the ruin of it now, but there's no sign, no plaque and not much awareness there that it was present. It was made at John Brown Shipyard on the Clyde, which is interesting in itself. It has the blades of a helicopter. Many of the early windmill technologists or engineers came from aeronautics. 1950s, so five years after the war, there, there is fresh in their mind. And this was partly put here because um, the hill is so beautiful. <laughs> it's a, I'm going to come back to him, but it's a perfectly formed hill. You can see it here. And um, there you are. <laughs> it was the perfect site for studying the effect of, of the slope on wind. That was one of the things they were trying to establish. Costa Head is in the northeast of, you know, they have that lovely way in Orkney of calling the, the main island the mainland. So it's in the northeast of the mainland. And um, I'll just go back. It was put up there primarily by this guy, E.W. Golding, who was the leader of the ERA, which was the early um, pioneers of wind, of, of all alternative, alternative energy. There's very little written on him. They don't even know when he was born. He has a question mark on his birthday. He trained in electronics and then moved through wartime experience into wind energy. What's really interesting about his project is it was very tied in with the UN and with experimental projects around the world. Uh, in Israel, Denmark, America, but especially in the developing countries. And he saw the common factor between somewhere like Orkney, where you didn't have a grid, and somewhere in Africa, where you didn't have a grid. So he was interesting, interested in how this technology could liberate um, mainly agricultural and rural communities. And what I, where I did go into the technology a bit, and do find it very beautiful and moving, was that this place is where British scientists took new steps trying to understand the wind. Because once you put up a structure like a windmill turbine, you need to understand the wind in a new way. Especially you have to understand the effect of gusts. And to understand gusts in 1950 was quite difficult, when all you have is a cupped anonymeter, anonymeter? You don't have a computer. And you've got to understand the shift in wind over a second. They didn't understand it that well because the windmill kind of blew down. <laughs> it didn't entirely blow down, but they, they found that it couldn't cope with the level of wind. But science always proceeds through its failures. They, this is their, their measuring device. So that's the most important <coughs> device for measuring the wind in Britain. And this is their other structures, which the remains of them are still there in foundations. And I, I called my visit there really a work of archaeology. So I was interested in the fact that this technology had been so lost. There's one film you can find, like one of those GPO films, with no sound, about nine minutes long. And there's, there's almost nothing else. I'm hoping we'll include the film in the exhibition. 
It's really a wonder. They put some kind of Mendelssohn type music to it. <laughs> a bit like the Eden line or something. Quite wonderful. Um, these are wind flowers, uh, wind, sorry, wind roses, which is how you know the wind. This is a view of Costa Head from Rousey, just to give you, remind us again of that idea of alignment. And interestingly, that little bit of sea there, which is above a little island called Einhalo, is one of the sites they're looking at putting the new wave devices up there, because this channel is a very, in my technical language, I'd say it's good for waves. Uh, so this is the remains that exist. This was the little observation hut. This was, um, I think, one of the wind devices. And perhaps you can just see in the background the uh, wind farm at Burger Hill, which was also pioneering. It was put in the mid-80s, I think. And that's one of the shackles that would have held the... Uh, um, staves of the turbine. So I'm going to read you a little poem about this because it's now I've gone too far because it's the best. Um, in fact, could Chris, would you mind just taking us back yeah. and then take us through them? This one's a bit longer, but don't worry, it doesn't go on that long. It's a bit longer. Right? <laughs> Cross the head. Would you want to start? Just go back slowly and then go through them just so people can pick up the texture of them. In the ERA lab, white-coated minds calculated their sums. Minus the winds, sea-assisted island blast. Designing the tower, fixing the pitched variable blades adopted from a helicopter. Adding the generator to the snug nacelle welded on Clydeside. Golding's iconic spire cast a shadow lattice, crisscrossing the cant of peat hags, rushes, and bog cotton. Engineers strove to comprehend the wind's pitch of swirling distortion and the flux of micro forces that were unleashed in each irrational gust, given measure in instruments which, gave the, which gauged the shock inflicted by a gouster, suggesting stress capable of shearing braced steel, as was proven on the night a hurricane put an end to the experiment, leading to the removal of the turbine. Today's breeze tickles a lull on the hill, where their trials discerned pattern and direction in veering winds, finding a mean value for the exemplary slope, mapping its gradation, logging the prevailing fronts propelled over the crags, whirling through the cup counter anemometer each second, <clears throat> producing data for each year's run of wind, plotted as wind roses, whose abstract blooms predicted the yield that might flower in kilowatts per hour. Time has reduced this new technology to archaeology, seen in the shell of the concrete hut and patchwork remains of mica-encrusted bays, sunken foundations and rusty pegs, thick twisted cables and metal stops sunken in the moor. Golding's achievement still towers tacit in the elevation of the stays that I imagine lifting from the broad ring of sloping bays where giant moths sag in the grasses, shorn of tension, having nothing left to grip on. Wind and ideas have prevailed in those blades, wheeling their tips slowly over, slowly over, through the azure above Burger Hill, on this green isle where theories were tested and results exchanged with wind pioneers around the globe, sharing successes, learning from failures, demonstrating the sustaining logic of motion, 
that set windmills revolving in such rich profusion of designs, as in the turlows that energize these outset aisles in tomorrow's winds and today's gales. And you can maybe see in that poem that conjunction of romantic and specialist language, the language of the, the wind engineer and the language of a poet who's only able really to perceive the place itself. And it, it is fascinating to me to think of how close this is to the Ring of Rodger, which we don't understand, but which has a sign explaining it. 